Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yes. <laughs> can Can you hear me now? Am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, <laughs> um. So this is a reprise of the presentation I did at TC39 two weeks ago, um, and uh, it starts kind of like this. It's been a long time since I presented at TC39 last. Uh, in 2009, 2009, Mark invited me to present uh, uh, CommonJS, or what, a proposal that would become CommonJS. And in 2010, I had an opportunity to speak again uh, about what can we do about this new CommonJS menace that we've created. And, uh, and since then, uh, a long time has elapsed. Uh, and uh, this is an update on the compartments proposal. Oh, pardon. What, what I learned from that experience was two things. Uh, first, under no circumstances should you ever attempt to tell a joke at plenary. And the other thing I learned was to never under any circumstances uh, present a proposal for a module constructor. And we'll just see how that goes, shall we? Um, this is an update on the compartments proposal, which has been stage one for the last two years. And since then, we've been vetting it. And we've most recently joined an effort called Module Harmony, where we're trying to align this proposal with other module related proposals that are in flight. And, uh, and as, an, uh, as an effect of that, we've broken the proposal up into new layers. Um, so to begin, let's talk about motivation. What do we do with modules today? We do a lot of things with modules today. We got a lot of verbs for modules, run, load, transport, bundle, et cetera. Um, the point of this uh, proposal is not to create new motivating use cases. It is to make the existing motivating use cases uh, more streamlined. That is to say, to make production use cases more closely resemble their corresponding use cases in development uh, and uh, to bring to bring these things closer together. Um, and to that end, we have the compartments proposal, which does a whole bunch of things, which originally was framed as a proposal about host virtualization. That is to say, um, providing ways for a host to pretend to be another host with, with hooks in JavaScript and user code. Um, we have since learned that most of what we wanted from host virtualization can be achieved by having a virtualizable module loader and the ability to virtualize the global uh, the global scope. Um, and uh, in order to bring the compartments proposal more in close alignment with the other module proposals in flight, which are deferred execution, module blocks, module fragments, and uh, and and so on, the uh, we found that it was possible to reconstruct the compartment in terms of these finer uh, of these smaller, smaller layers. And you'll notice as we go through those layers that each of these layers has different motivating use cases and unlocks different uh, different usage of the module system, each of which might have different proponents and, and, and allows us to build different coalitions around developing each of the layers of this proposal uh, with different interested parties. So not everybody is interested in all of these layers. Some people are only interested in any of these layers if we get all of them, and some people are more uh, are interested in different subsets. Um, so uh, there are some dependencies along these layers. It isn't it isn't strictly layered. We don't have to get every single one of these into the language in order to make progress. They unlock different things at different points. But the first layer is. Uh, is foundational not just to the compartment proposal, but to other proposals that are in flight as well. Um, at, at layer zero, we, we would introduce a first class module constructor and module source constructor. This would unlock the ability to do multiple instantiation of modules um, and also unlocks deferred execution in, um, in relation to other proposals. It serves as a foundation for these other proposals so that they share some common ground on which we can reason about how coherent all of these module proposals are. Then a layer down, we would introduce module reflection. Uh, that is to say, to, uh, to uh, make it possible to see, uh, to statically analyze a module without executing it. And that's useful for creating bundlers, for building import map tooling and other use cases. And then a layer underneath that uh, or above, which way is up? 
um, first, uh, we would int introduce first class module sources. And what this would allow us to do is to virtualize the notion of, uh, of, an, of a module that participates in the JavaScript module graph, such that other languages can participate as well in with definitions in user code. Um, this would allow us to, for example, create a bridge from CommonJS. Uh, it allows us to create other kinds of asset modules like CSS and HTML components, and it allows us to do so in a way that allows the ecosystem to have more than <laughs> one opinion about how these ought to be done. Um, which is uh, which is good for the evolution of the ecosystem, um, as a, as opposed to having a single definition in the spec of T, uh, in two six two. The layer underneath that is evaluators. Now we need evaluators to make compartments. And they would say evaluators are a mechanism for isolating the global scope for uh, uh, for any of the three ways that the language would allow us to evaluate text. Um, and allow us to evaluate a module or, or a program or a script in the context of a different global object. But it happens to be that this is also useful for, um, for uh, creating composable DSLs. That is to say, we currently have Jasmine, Jest, and Grunt and other kinds of DSLs that all um, uh, depend on being able to introduce uh, functions in the global scope. Uh, and, uh, and currently, you could that we have to employ a number of different tricks in order to make those evaluators, uh, pardon, in order to make the, those global functions cooperate when you have multiple modules and different DSLs in the same program. Evaluators would allow us to make that more composable. Um, and then on top of that, with lockdown and compartments, we would be able to do the full agenda for compartments, which is both lockdown and isolation of an ecosystem so that we can defend a program against supply chain attacks. Uh, by minimizing the authority that's given to third-party dependencies. Um, so let's go in and take a look at each of the layers. In phase zero, uh, I propose first-class modules and a, uh, a module source constructor. Uh, that what this would look like is a module source constructor, which returns an object that represents the compiled artifact of, uh, of a module source. This is um, this does not initialize or execute any code. It just compiles and analyzes a piece of JavaScript source text. Um, with that, you can then instantiate it as uh, and create a module instance with a virtualized behavior for how it connects itself to its dependencies and what meta uh, what the import meta object will be in the context of that module when it is evaluated. This produces an object that represents the eventual execution of that module. And using and and we propose to overload dynamic import such that if it receives a module instance instead of a string, it would take that module and then advance it to its most uh, and, and advance it to its terminal state and return a promise for the namespace object of that module or an error if it fails, or if any of its transitive dependencies fail. Um, what this means is that if you were to use dynamic import on the same module instance twice you would get the same namespace object. However, if you were to create, oh, oh excuse me, uh, everybody pull out your plenary bingo cards um, and check off, Chris proposes a module constructor. Um, it's, uh, it's, um, then uh, supposing that if, uh, but uh, uh, suppose instead you created two module instances from the same source, you would amortize the cost of compiling the source um, but be able to get separate instances. Uh, this becomes significant later on when it's possible to create multiple instances in different evaluator scopes. Um, but uh, but in general, this means the idea is that we memoize. We do not. We don't have. Uh, we don't so much as memoize module instances. We just uh, ensure that we only get one namespace object for every module instance. We get one. Uh, one to one to one relationship of all of the things corresponding to a module instance per uh, construction of a module. And this is what it looks like to virtualize the import graph. You would provide an import hook, which receives an import specifier and tentatively an import meta object. Uh, and the responsibility of the import hook is to take these two pieces of information and provide another module instance. And it does not, again, matter whether the module instance is initialized or not. It can be in an uninitialized state or a later state. Uh, the point of this is that you can create a bank of uninitialized modules or, or mo a combination of uninitialized and initialized modules and then build a module graph by driving the import hook uh, and the host. Pardon the engine. <laughs> JavaScript would 
uh, drive the import hook when you call dynamic import on a module, and then it would advance all of the transitive dependencies to their final state. Um, and so the responsibilities of an import hook are to resolve, locate, and fetch, and then compile and return a module instance for a particular specifier in a particular module um, as identified by the import meta. So import hooks are reusable across multiple module instances, which is an important factor for memory. Uh, and, um, and, and importantly, this means that an import hook can take over the cons all of these individual concerns and provide separate solutions for them. For example, resolution is dependent on the host environment and done different ways depending on what host you're emulating. Locating can be based off of, uh, locating and fetching can be based off of any storage mechanism and address space that you receive the module texts from. So that is to say, it could be a database, it could be a zip file, it could be the web, it could be your file system. Um, and this, this mechanism allows any host to emulate any other host with this hook. Module reflection is the next layer down. And so again, we've so far with layer zero, all we've really uncovered is a foundation for understanding all of the sub, all of the other related module proposals and an ability to do multiple instantiation, which isn't itself all particularly useful in order to unlock more benefits from having this foundation the first layer would be module reflection. And this would allow us to write tools that are able to analyze an import graph and construct uh, and by by constructing module sources that can in which we can analyze their uh, their shallow imports. And then from this, we can build tools that build out entire dependency graphs. That means we could build something that generates an import map. We can write a bundler. We can write a runtime for a bundle using this mechanism. Um, and then we could also do other tricks that have become popular in the JavaScript ecosystem, including hot module replacement, which is uh, which is to say watching all of your modules and then rebuilding your graph at runtime and reinitializing portion of the graph that changed or anything that depended on the part of the graph that changed um, uh, during development. Um, and then similarly, test watchers do something very similar to that, where they watch the file system and then rerun your tests whenever any of the tests transitive dependencies change. Uh, and again, between having a module constructor, a module source constructor, and then adding this feature to the module source constructor so that you can analyze the bindings of a module gives us a full picture for building all of that ecosystem. But again, only for ESM. So for if you wanted to go beyond ECMAScript modules and allow modules from uh, other languages to participate, we need a way to create different kinds of module sources that can participate in the graph. And so we come up with a protocol where a source can uh, declare what its bindings are such that the machinery behind the module loader can go off and do fetching of transitive dependencies and provide an initialize or execute or a function similarly named that uh, that serves the purpose of uh, when it's the time in the execution of all of the modules, this is the behavior that corresponds to this particular thing. And with this, we can build common JS support, a uh, very high fidelity common JS support for the subset of common JS that is already bundleable, which is to say that the ecosystem has already herded a large portion of the common JS dependency libraries into an ecosystem where largely they are bundleable um, if they need to be bundleable. And if they fit that subset that is heuristically analyzable, where you can say, hey, if there's a require function followed by a string, I know that's a transitive, I, that's a shallow dependency, we can build common JS out of this primitive. Um, and notably, also, uh, the WebAssembly contingent is, is motivated by uh, something similar to this, uh, that module source, uh, that the WebAssembly module object can participate in this ecosystem uh, as a module source. And if module sources are not provided by the host, they can be emulated using this mechanism. So then that brings us to the evaluator layer. And the idea here is to provide a constructor that uh, where I can provide a global object, an import hook, and an import meta, uh, and anything. And, and from that, I will get a new eval, a new function constructor, and a new module constructor. And with these, um, the, the, the resulting eval function and module would all evaluate code within a emulated global environment 
with this global object import hook and import meta. And the import hook and import meta are not necessarily, they are not useful for the module constructor, right? Because uh, it has its own, though it could default to these from the evaluator. Um, but, uh, but, but the use for them is actually because dynamic import is also supported in the script <clears throat> context. So if you were to eval within a module, or eval with a, within a function or use dynamic import directly within a function body, the import hook and import meta provided here to the evaluators constructor would be used. Um, and this gives us the ability to fully isolate uh, isolate code that's running so that it only sees the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the global object that's been given. And while we are at Agoric are motivated to have this because we want to be able to secure our supply chain, um, and create environments where uh, mutually suspicious programs can exist in the same memory. Um, it is also happens to be useful for other things like creating these composable DSLs. Currently, DSLs like Jasmine or Jest um, have to punch the shared global object with functions like describe or whatnot, um, or before or after. And in order for these to work, they either have to be in separate realms, which has its own caveats and, and hazards, uh, like identity continuity, identity discontinuities become possible in those environments, or they choose a, a more lightweight uh, solution where they just say, uh, we are going to only allow one uh, DSL evaluation to occur concurrently and we'll just keep a, 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 a name and dynamic scope that associates those function calls with the files that they originated from. Um, and alternately, you can do DSLs using with blocks for much the same purpose. So evaluate some code in the context of a with block, and then you can decide uh, and provide uh, uh, closures. But what, with this, we can do something much more graceful. We can uh, allow um, we can allow uh, uh, somebody to, for example, let me um, uh, pull up the DSL. With this, we would be able to say, I want to construct a new set of evaluators. I'm going to provide a global this, which inherits from the existing global, but I'm going to give it specific describe before and after functions. And in this case, you're running their code in an environment that's very similar to running a module inside of a with block, but without the with block. Um, and also allowing a single module to be affected by these, to see these new globals, and the rest of its transitive dependencies do not see these globals in their global scope. Um, and likewise, uh, it's just showing how evaluator composes with module, you would be able to get a module constructor out of the evaluator's bag and then instantiate a single module, um, and that module would see the global object that you provided to the evaluator. And then from this, we can actually construct what we already have been vetting for a couple of years in the compartment proposal entirely in user code. And the purpose of Ed, this is not, this highly redacted slide is not an error. I didn't want you guys to read the code instead of listening to me. <laughs> um, but the purpose of this slide is to show you how much code, right? And that, and this might actually be too much or too little, depending on what, uh, depending on your use case. By one of the common use cases for a module system is to, uh, it, we envision is to be able to write a runtime, an alternate runtime for something like uh, an, an, imp an Im new and improved import map that you're experimenting with in the ecosystem, or or something so, or a new bundle format. In which case, you're writing a program that uh, that is needs to be inlined in the HTML of the of the of the page that is going to benefit from this bundle. In order to avoid having to take to the consequence of round trip times to the server, you want to get as much power into as small of a file as possible that you've inlined into your initial HTML. And if that's the case, you might still want a natively implemented compartment because then in that case, you would not have to, have to write this, you'd not have to inline this code. Similarly, um, for uh, for the embedded systems use case, there, the, similarly, you might have to, the, your code segment size is going to be a limitation. And also, if we have a native compartment, in addition to these primitives that it's built out of, there is a possibility that we need to explore still that uh, it might be possible to have a lighter um, uh, a lighter footprint on the the heap at runtime in an embedded system by avoiding unnecessarily, unnecessary reification of intermediate objects. But that is speculative. Um, and that's, that's the presentation as a whole. 
And I, uh, at plenary, I, I, I provided this very brief, actually, uh, presentation for a 90-minute speaking slot, knowing that modules are kind of the third rail when it comes to uh, inviting people to talk about them in a standards body, and there's plenty to talk about. So at this point, I opened the floor and had we had a great conversation um, with, uh, with the delegates uh, at TC39, no notably, um, uh, at, at, at risk of misrepresenting other delegates' point of view, <laughs> points of view on a recording, uh, 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 I, I think that we, what we can say is that uh, the delegate from Google was uh, surprisingly um, surprisingly. Um, I, I wouldn't say supportive, but but. Uh, 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 with... uh, Chris, Chris, just I just wanted to remind you, we're recording this for purposes of public displaying yeah. the recording. Okay. Which is why I'm being so very careful of representing Shu's point of view. It is in the notes. Please feel okay. free to check okay. the minutes from from plenary. But we Great. were surprised. Uh, we were surprised by his reception, um, and uh, and and though he did uh, uh, what was hesitant about evaluators. Um, and uh, and we also uh, received some surprising support from uh, de a delegate from Bloomberg who was uh, actually really excited about evaluators for cases beyond the uh, the compartment use case. Um, and uh, uh, Rob Palmer, the chair, was very uh, supportive of uh, any solution that we might be able to fit in the context of this framework that would help the ecosystem migrate from common JS to ESM. And he pointed out very, uh, very, tr very truly that the ecosystem still by weight is mostly common JS and, uh, and ESM has struggled to be adopted. Um, and, uh, and to that, my point is that, uh, uh, I think that we do have a compelling solution from bridging common JS and that it is valuable to bridge common JS because um, the the best way to get common JS to go away is to make a bridge from common JS to ESM, which somewhat counterintuitively would allow common JS to exist forever. <clears throat> um, but uh, uh, but only with that bridge can we get code to move in the direction of ESM. So um, your 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 prior slide. Um... Uh, a piece that I, I missed in the plenary about the redaction is that this is this is basically a an anti-distraction tool as opposed to a subtextual commentary on Unicode versus TC39. <laughs> Indeed, uh, th this is not actually uh, any commentary about Unicode. Though I, um, I thank you for reminding me. Uh, I I, uh, I think that at plenary, I failed to give Chip credit for um, a horrible idea on plenary bingo, where I suggested that uh, that I think that there should be a meta game for plenary bingo, where uh, delegates are challenged to construct the proposal that fills the largest contiguous section of their bingo card, um, of of someone's bingo card, for example, a. Uh, uh, Oh, well, Chip's terrible idea that I, I think that we agreed should never be um, should never be put to record. <laughs> the idea that shall not be named. Yeah, exactly. Does that mean it's time to turn off the recording? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing I'd like to in, in, to uh, include on the recording that's also uh, I think a, was a major component of the discussion uh, at TC39 is in the public notes. Uh, is that um, uh, the relationship of lockdown and compartments and the goal stated for compartments, uh, I noticed that uh, this time that I didn't notice originally that on uh, Chris's layers slide, uh, layer five, it does say lockdown and compartments. Uh, not that slide, the, that, this that one. does say lockdown and compartments, but then the, the talk itself only explained compartments. Uh, Shu, hearing only the uh, explanation of evaluators and compartments without an explanation of lockdown, uh, correctly objected that um, uh, there, there's 
not enough mechanism here to actually provide the isolation. Um, and that, uh, um, and it's only once you also explain lockdown that we can understand how these mechanisms together provide the isolation benefits. Uh, Chris, would you like to explain lockdown while we're recording? Yeah, uh, the idea, uh, so uh, I proposed to shoot the delegate from Google that an alternative, alternative way to get compartments that is coherent would be um, not to provide a compartment primitive, but to provide a lockdown primitive that reveals a compartment uh, and harden, but uh, uh, it, it in their whole. So, uh, Shu made the, the the comment that it's hard to get that right, and he's true, and it's true. It is hard to get that right, and if you just leave the primitives around, people are likely to implement it incorrectly. Um, the which is also true. Um, the so the idea is what if instead uh, we we came back to TC thirty nine with a proposal for for lockdown in its full so like currently the the premise is that if we had all of these primitives we could implement lockdown entirely in user space and not trouble the user with it and and I think and I do still feel that that is the right way to go forward because enshrining too much in the specification has its own set of risks um, but. Uh, let me talk a bit about what lockdown does. Um, lockdown is a function that would take an existing realm, a single realm, um, and create and, and, and uh, allow it to be broken into sub compartments. And in each compartment, uh, there would, each compartment would have its own global object, but that global object would give that compartment a view into the shared intrinsics from a shared realm. And those intrinsics would, uh, all of the intrinsics that are shared between compartments are transitively frozen. Uh, and so each compartment has its own global and it also has a unique set of evaluators. So the eval function constructor and module constructor provided that we take this framing um, are unique per compartment and properties of its unique global object. But all of the other properties that a compartment gets by default, like the array constructor, the object constructor, et cetera, are actually just uh, the unmodified shared intrinsics. There are a number of other constructors like the date constructor and the math namespace, which are also per compartment. Um, and they're per, uh, oh wait, no, that's not true. No, th those are also shared, but they're not the same as the ones in the original. Um, uh, they're not in the same as in, in the original realm. Um, because they need to have uh, certain behaviors removed. So like the date constructor uh, is denied by default the ability to tell time. Um, it's only allowed to compute about rel uh, times relative to each other. And uh, math, um, we uh, defang the random number generator. So compartments can't use that to communicate with each other by observing the passage of the, uh, the pseudo random number generator sequence. And um, internationalization has that problem too. Intel is simply omitted from the shared intrinsics um, because it, with, there's no easy way to make it possible to share Intel across compartments. Um, which is to say that, uh, that the nature of, of lockdown is that it provides a view into a subset of the intrinsics, the, the frozen shared subset of the intrinsics that I think is likely to evolve and grow over time carefully um, and it may and whether the right venue to evolve and grow that is the right venue for the evolution of lockdown is 262 or user space is a um, a, a design tension okay uh, so um, uh, I think it is uh, and it you know it's quite possible that you know, we want to take layer layer five here layer four the fifth layer. Um, and um, break it into... for, for the record, during the presentation, I actively regret using base uh, starting with zero, to be clear. Yeah. But in any case, the, the lockdown and compartment layer, uh, I can certainly see breaking it off into a separate proposal that, that makes its way through committee following the, um, the first four. Uh, but I do think it, need, it does need to go into the standard 
uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, XS uh, builds it into the platform uh, and TC53 will be standardizing on it uh, because there is no free lockdown uh, um, situation in the embedded context. The, the, the result of lockdown is all that embedded code sees. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I think is, is that uh, only once it goes into TC39, so once it goes into 262, uh, does it become possible to robustly defend the integrity of lockdown against other changes in the 262 spec? So for example, there was a spec, there's a proposal that seems very, very benign called iteration helper. It seems like it's completely orthogonal to all of these issues except that iteration helpers as written introduces two more primordials that cannot be reached by property traversal from the global. And therefore all, it's impossible to write existing lockdown code that would freeze those primordials if, it, if they're not frozen, um, uh, you know, it's impossible to write shim code that, that would, that, that uh, written in ignorance of, of the, the new proposal that would succeed at freezing those primordials. Uh, and if they're not frozen, then you've created a security hole. Once lockdown becomes part of the spec, then the invariant uh, can be maintained by making coordinated changes in the spec to, um, uh, to include in the frozen primordial set all primordials that are introduced. In fact, that would be the natural way to do it. And then it would be the, the, the platforms that are avoiding breaking the security rather than difficult coordination with the shim writers. I think that's a really important point. And something that I hadn't twigged to until you said it just now with respect to that the TC53 thing points out is that lockdown is actually has sort of two aspects. One is the semantics of lockdown, meaning what does it mean to be in a lockdown state in terms of what you can and cannot do? And the other is the API for lockdown, which is what is the what are, what are the controls for, for uh, engaging it? And um, um, with embedded systems where code essentially is born in a lockdown state, that, that second question doesn't come up, but in the context of something like a web browser, it very much does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some other important changes that lockdown uh, does is uh, evaluation within the lockdown system is only strict mode. Uh, JavaScript sloppy mode has been removed from existence uh, in the lockdown system. Uh, and indeed the uh, shipping uh, TC53 and, and Modable in that configuration just doesn't need any mechanism in the shipping virtual machine in the ROM for supporting JavaScript sloppy mode. Um, another one is that in order to have the evaluation, evaluation only per compartment, we have to lock down rewires uh, the, the evaluator prototype, specifically function.prototype, its dot constructor points at an inert function constructor, one that only throws. That would also happen with a module.prototype dot constructor would be an inert module constructor. Um, uh, and so, and what we found empirically is that rewiring causes uh, practically no existing legacy code to break. I noticed this slide talks about unlocking lockdown. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, wonder where my head was. Um, uh, so so uh, in terms of ways forward for hardened JavaScript at TC39, there are essentially two. Um, one way forward is that we get z layers zero, one, and three 
which are sufficient to have an ECMAScript module system that, is, that under lockdown implemented in user code. Um, there's an, and the objection that uh, Shu from Google has to that is that it, it's <laughs> evaluators and evaluators are the, certainly the most risky, um, the most risky of these, these primitives. And uh, I, I believe the position is that um, they would be difficult to use correctly. Um, and uh, so I believe that there is a coherent response to that objection where we omit three and instead the only way, it, omitting three in order to get all the way to compartments, we would need layers zero, one, and four in the language. Um, and of course, uh, two is a would be nice regardless uh, in order to create a bridge to, from, to WASM or CommonJS or any, any module source type that is not anticipated by the host. Yeah, uh, Bloomberg uh, had an interest important response to Shu, which is evaluators as shown on this slide uh, have uses other than isolation. DSL use is quite compelling. And uh, you know, Bloomberg supported that that was quite compelling. So what we could say is that um, uh, the, is that is to still push for evaluators as part of module harmony, but to do it with all the rhetoric around it being that it's there to support DSLs uh, and then really uh, have the, you know, be very consistently explaining the fifth layer as the one that's uh, coming in a separate later proposal for uh, supporting isolation. Um, yeah, and another interesting thing about the layer numbered three, the fourth layer, if you will, is that it also puts an anchor point in the language for in the future, maybe um, uh, providing better support for REPLs. Um, REPLs have this thing called a global contour, which is not currently specified in 2.6.2, um, but it essentially allows um, evaluating uh, the evaluation of multiple programs in, in, in the context of a, of a particular evaluator <clears throat> to grow the global contour, which is to say that anything defined by let or const from a previous evaluation would, con would persist between calls to eval. Uh, not eval necessary, but uh, like if there were an eval script method added to the evaluator bag, for example. One thing to be, be, be cautious about um, with this strategy that Mark just outlined is um, while we don't need three to have four, and therefore you could postpone three evaluators to a, a, later, um, a later thing, you have an open question about well, given the the well, it's it's tricky to use evaluators for compartment compartmentalization, which was Shu's point. Um, um, if you put in evaluators motivated by the DSL use case, it is possible, and I think this is just something to be 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 wary of uh, that one might have a, 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 uh, an evaluator design that um, actively impeded the strategy to do compartments, um, which might actually be an argument for doing evaluators later, because once apartments, uh, compartments are a thing, then necessarily whatever you come up with for evaluators has to be compatible with that. I yeah. think with us being such an active part of the process, there's not much danger in that. Whatever, you know, whatever evolution happens with evaluators, we will, you know, we, we will be actively maintaining. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying uh, 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 the, the hazard is, is substantial. I'm just saying this is a one little thing that we would want to keep our eye out for. Yeah, the, the reason why I'm eager for it is that, um, if evaluators go in early, um, then we can we know that we can build the rest of the shim well um, on top of that, except we still have the hazard of having to track breaking changes in 262 like the iteration helpers. 
Uh, but other than that, uh, evaluators solve a major problem for us in enabling us to create the shim well, uh, you know, without yeah. using width. There's also, um, it's also the, the case that uh, what the invariant we actually need in order to get, uh, in order to preserve the integrity of lockdown shims uh, in the wild over time is that uh, it, it isn't that we, it isn't as strong as, it, it, like the easiest way to say is that the, to, to, to express our desire is, hey, no new intrinsics should be added to the language that that are uh, uh, that can't be discovered by uh, a property walk from the global this of the of the base realm. That is stronger than we actually need. Um, uh, a more relaxed way of putting that would be to say that we we need there to be no uh, we need need there to be that be impossible for an intrinsic to be revealed by any mechanism. If it is not, uh, <laughs> if it is not also, um, if by any mechanism from the position of a shared, an existing shared intrinsic of a compartment, right? So if Intel, for example, which doesn't participate <coughs> in shared intrinsics, adds a method that returns an object with a prototype that isn't that isn't uh, discoverable by a property walk from global this in the incubator realm, that's not actually a problem for us. Iterator help, helpers are, um, but but our position is even more relaxed than that. Is that if any of those objects are added to the language, as long as they're also exposed by some well-known mechanism for enumerating the, the uh, enumerating the discoverable shared intrinsics of of a compartment specifically, that would be sufficient um, for our purposes, right? Uh, the, so, like uh, an alternate view of this would be that there's another proposal called Get Intrinsics that Jordan Harbend is uh, is pushing that would allow him to uh, have a, a function in Global Scope that could be used to find the original intrinsic for any name um, in the language. Uh, there's a variation on that that Jordan is not pushing for that would allow us to enumerate all such objects. Um, uh, and and if that if we had that, then we wouldn't need so much, um, uh, so such a strong invariant from the language if uh, that that we would need lockdown in order to preserve its integrity uh, over time. Maybe like a compartment that get unreachables. Essentially, yeah. Right. The, 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 the tool to reach the unreachables. Um, I I I I can see the value in that. Although, um, just based on what Mark has said here, I I'm much more favorably disposed to an idea or idea that really wasn't on my radar at all until till just now, which is um, to 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 push harder on making lockdown part of the spec because um, that just that just covers a multitude of of potential future. Uh, 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 time ops. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also My every... feeling is that we should pursue every option available to yes, us. Yes. His suspenders yeah. and belt. Yes. Yeah. I mean, every, every time we say to the authors of some proposal, the proponents of some proposal, uh, no, you can't do that because it would break our ability to write a secure shim. It's always a fight because they're not using our secure shim. Right. Whereas once it's in once it's in the language and it's the responsibility of TC39 to maintain the security of the item that is now in the language for pr providing the security. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. It isn't. It isn't just that. It's it's actually more like um, having it in the language is not sufficient. Having users of the feature in the wild is mm. is, is the actual yes the actual anchor. As, as as we know, we may eventually be able to eliminate symbol species, for example. Um, uh. Yeah, my my intuition is that if 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 compartments and lockdown were in fact part of the language, that very quickly we get a large amount of use in the wild, and suddenly the whole world would be dependent on, it, which is exactly what we want. 
it would be significantly more slippery. Yeah, getting adoption would be significantly easier if um, some of the caveats of a sham were eliminated for sure. Yeah, but but the, the even with even prior to adoption, I think we're underestimating the effect on the committee process. For, so let me use an example. Uh, we now have uh, accepted in stage three, which means it's effect, you know, effectively understood to be part of the language, uh, the realms proposal with the callable boundary that prevents any entangling of the object graph. Nobody's using it yet. It has zero adoption in the wild, uh, or rather, you know, outside of Salesforce. Um, uh, but if anybody were to think of a proposal where a consequence of the proposal would be to breach the object graph isolation, it would be immediately a dead letter without a fight in the committee because everybody understands that the isolation of the object graph is now an invariant we need to defend because we have accepted realms with that security property into the language. Well, there's also, there's also a, yeah, it, 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 it alters the, the, the default in the, in the argument, which is um, instead of justifying, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff where we're trying to argue for, um, you know, for something like a, a lockdown or, or, or isolation mechanisms, and we get pushback that's, that's in the form of sort of vague, uh, well, maybe that might get in the way of some hypothetical future use case mumble mumble that somebody might want to do something that would be blocked by that mumble mumble, as opposed to um, the scenario that you just outlined, Mark, which is somebody proposing a very specific thing, which is not some mumble mumble hypothetical future use case. It's a concrete proposal, at which point you can ask so why do you want to do that? Um, and you can you can push back on it with with pointed, uh, reasoned argument because you're not arguing against some vague thing. You're arguing against something specific. Yep. All right. I oh. think this is a good point to cut the recording. Um, thank you for coming to the reprise. Yeah, this yeah, was this you. was this was helpful for me even though I saw it the first time.